Triple Tasman Coast Track is one of New Zealand's 10 great walks. If you're looking for an easy introduction to multi-day tramping, then stay tuned because in this video, I'm covering off everything that you need to know before planning your hike of the Abel Tasman Coast Track. I'm going to be covering things such as a typical itinerary on the track, the kind of weather you can expect along the way, the facilities that the track has to offer and much much more. To skip ahead to any section check the description down below. One of New Zealand's 10 great walks, the Abel Tasman Coast Track is a 60 km tram which can be completed in as little as 3 and as many as 5 days. Unlike many of New Zealand's other great walks, the track entirely follows the coastline, undulating consistently along its length. It's possible to hike the Abel Tasman Coast Track in either direction. However, it's far more common to begin at the southern terminus in Mudahoe and finish up at Wainui Bay. The track is a perfect introduction to multi-day tramping for both new hikers and young families, as it's very well maintained and has an easy to intermediate grade. It's common to find not just through hikers, but also plenty of day hikers on the track due to its convenient location and ease of access to different locations along the way. The Abel Tasman Coast Track is located in the Marlborough region at the top of the South Island of New Zealand. A four day through hike of the Abel Tasman Track might begin in Marahoe with day one winding its way over marshland and through native bush along arguably the most scenic part of the coastline on your way to Anchorage for the first night. In the morning, tackle the Torrent Bay Estuary Crossing, the first of three along the route. The estuary may be crossed in around 30 minutes at low tide, but a high tide route is also available, adding an extra hour of hiking. Along the way, you'll pass the track junction to Cleopatra's Pool, a popular swimming hole. Climb up and over the headland to a 42 metre long swing bridge spanning the Falls River before a final climb to Bark Bay, your destination for the second evening. If you time it right, make a low tide crossing of the Bark Bay estuary the following day, otherwise take the 20 minute high tide route towards Onatahuti Beach. A small stream just after the campsite here may be up to 1.5 metres deep at high tide, so be wary of this. At the end of the beach, cross a small bridge onto low-lying marshland before beginning your climb to Thomas Saddle, the track's second highest point. Take advantage of the panoramic views out to Awaroa Bay as you descend down to your destination for the evening at Awaroa Hut. You'll need to time your departure from Awaroa Hut carefully, as the following day brings a compulsory crossing of the Awaroa Estuary, which can only be crossed between two hours before and two hours after low tide. Once you're through the estuary, it's only a two hour hike ahead, including a short distance along the stunningly beautiful Goat Bay before reaching Tōturunui campsite for the evening. Stay here for the night, or if you're feeling fit, push on just over three hours to Whariwharangi Hut. Pushing on just one more day allows you to explore the most remote region of the Abel Tasman National Park. Here, the track winds along the coastline towards Anapai Bay and Mutton Cove, where you can opt to take a one hour seal spotting detour to separation point. A short climb back up to the main track reveals views to Whariwharangi Bay before descending to Whariwharangi Hut, an iconic historic homestead now converted to hiker accommodation. The last hurdle is a nearly 200 metre climb to the track's highest point before the final descent to the Wainui Bay car park and your pre-booked shuttle bus collection. Tasman Coast Track enjoys a relatively settled climate with some of the highest annual sunshine hours in New Zealand. Throughout the summer months the average temperature sits around 25 degrees whilst in winter this drops to around 14. Winter is often considered the best time to walk the track being much cooler albeit with shorter days. Because of its great walk status the track is very well benched and maintained along its length. There are three main services that you'll be hiking on. 
your typical bush tracks through beech forest, soft sand walking along some of the park's idyllic beaches, but mainly you'll be hiking on hard clay tracks which are cut into the coastline. Clay tracks can be very hard on the feet and slippery in wet weather, so bear this in mind when you're planning your trip. Although always recommended, consider whether or not you really want to wear your usual sturdy tramping boots on this track. A good pair of trail runners not only has more cushioning on the hard clay than a typical boot, but also it will dry out faster if you choose to wear them on the estuary crossings along the way. The track drains very well, so don't expect a lot of mud along the main route of this track. However, if you do decide to venture off track down some of the side trails, then track conditions may change. The Abel Tasman Coast Track requires substantial planning for optimum enjoyment. Unless planned well in advance, both the tides and the transport options will dictate where and when you start and how far you'll be able to continue along the way. Whereas there are technically three estuary crossings on the track, only the crossing at Awaroa is compulsory. Depending on the time of year, this crossing can have a big effect on your planned itinerary. You'll need to consult a tide timetable prior to booking to ensure that you're able to reach your planned destination for the day within daylight hours. I've linked to a great website for checking tide times in the description below this video. Once you're out on trail though, often the hut wardens, if you're hiking during peak season, will remind you the tide times. But I also found that the tide times were posted at all the major estuary crossings. There are plenty of options for transport on the Abel Tasman Coast Track. And even though there are car parks at both ends of the track, it's really up to you whether or not you want to leave your car parked there for multiple days. If you're planning on hiking the full length of the track, then you might want to consider taking a shuttle bus. Shuttle buses run from the major centres, including Mochueka and Nelson. Depending on the company that you use, expect to pay about $55 to shuttle from Nelson to Wainui Bay and about $25 to $35 to shuttle from Nelson to Marahou. I've included links to some of these shuttle operators in the description down below, so don't forget to check those out. Due to its location, one of the primary methods of transport on the Able Tasman is by water taxi. If you prefer to use water taxi transport to or from the track, bear in mind that most taxis only operate between Apple Tree Bay and Tōturunui. As an idea of cost, a water taxi between Kaiteriteri and Tōturunui will set you back around about $50. Because I was booking last minute, I relied heavily on the staff at the Motueka Eyesight who took care of all the bookings for me. I ended up taking the Trek Express shuttle bus from Motueka to Wainui Bay, which took around two and a half hours, and then I was picked up by water taxi at Apple Tree Bay once I'd finished hiking. Because of its great walk status, the Abel Tasman Coast Track boasts some of the best facilities of multi-day hiking trails in New Zealand. In addition to the very well-maintained tracks, almost all of the campsites along the route have a purpose-built covered shelter for cooking under. And the larger campsites also have running water, although bear in mind that this must be treated before drinking. Before you set out, it's a really good idea to check the Department of Conservation website to see if the campsites that you're staying at do have a water supply or if you'll need to collect some along the way. And then of course, there are the flushing toilets. All the campsites that I stayed at featured flushing toilets, although disguised as long drops, which I was very grateful for. Although I didn't encounter any issues, it's always a good idea to carry a little bit of extra toilet paper with you, just in case. There are a total of four huts and 18 campsites along the route. Hut capacity ranges from 24 to 34 bunks, whilst the campsites can accommodate as few as six and as many as 100 hikers. The close proximity of huts and campsites to each other mean that, unlike many of the other Great Walks, hikers have plenty of options for where to stay along the route. But this doesn't mean that you can stop just anywhere. Huts and campsites do have to be booked in advance on the DOC website all year round. A night's accommodation at a hut for an adult will set you back around $32 or $38 depending on the time of year. 
whereas an adult can camp at any time of year for $15. New Zealand resident children can stay for free all year, although you must still book them in and international children play slightly cheaper than the adult rate. Although there are huts along this track, the more settled climate of this area makes this track a great option for camping rather than the traditional hut stays. Just make sure to be aware of weckers who are prone to stealing stray food and gear left outside your tent. From what I saw, most of the campsites were flat, although at some of the smaller sites you may have to search a while to find a relatively flat spot. And at Bark Bay, I even had to pitch my tent directly on the sand, which was a new experience for me. For those who prefer to hammock camp, bear in mind that none of the campsites are specifically set up for this, so you might struggle to find somewhere which is suitable. During peak season, there are wardens stationed at each of the huts and at Tōtorunui Camp. The wardens will check your booking, but they are also available to give you an update on track conditions along the way. Wi-Fi and cell phone coverage is limited along this track, but each hut and office does have access to a radio for emergencies. That brings us nicely on to what equipment or gear do you need to hike this track? Now I'm not going to delve deeply into a full gear list in this video, but if you're interested in checking out a typical multi-day hiking gear list, then take a look in the link I've left in the description of this video, or check out what gear I carried with me on Te Araroa, which I'll link for you up here. It's always a good habit to carry a personal locator beacon when you're out hiking in the wilderness. And even though the Abel Tasman Coast Track is located relatively close to some major centres, Accidents can still happen, and in an emergency, being able to send an SOS signal can be a lifesaver. Otherwise, as I briefly talked about before, just have a good thing about whether sturdy hiking boots are the right option for you, or if you can make do with something like a trail runner. There's very little technical hiking along this track, and so a more breathable shoe which dries faster might just be a better option for you. Don't forget your sunscreen, sunglasses and a sun hat. Wherever you hike in New Zealand, the UV rays are very strong and in summer, heat stroke can be a hike killer. And if you want to keep those pesky sandflies away, better pack some insect repellent. Make sure that you have the means to treat any water that you collect at campsites or huts. Although water is supplied to the larger huts and campsites, it's not pre-treated. And so a water filter like the Soya Squeeze or Catadine Bee Free will do the job. If you're in a pinch, boil your water for three minutes before using. The Abel Tasman track certainly has a lot to offer and is a fantastic option for those who are new to multi-day hiking. The region's settled and warmer climate makes it a year-round tramping destination, and as such, it can be busy. But adding the Abel Tasman track to your hiking to-do list won't disappoint. Join me next week for part one of my three-day adventure on the Abel Tasman Coast Track. <laughs>